Hey, Feminist Frequency listeners, we would love you to join our podcast community on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash femfreak. You know, the the teacher is named Iris and she studied yoga in India for like a week and she like, you know, farts sandalwood and sweats lavender and you know that she's like 93 (laughs) pounds. There's that. That is a great tender bio. Yeah. (laughs) Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is episode 72, and I'm your host, Anita Sarkeesian, and I'm joined by my wonderful, amazing, favorite co-host, Ebony Adams. Ooh, Carol's going to be mad. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when you're not on, Carol's my favorite, so that's how this works. I knew that, though. And we have a very special guest, Francesca Fiorentini. Hey. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love, or alternatively, we're the feminist killjoys coming for your media, depending on your perspective. Today, we're going to be talking about the absolutely harrowing new HBO documentary, Leaving Neverland. And after that, we'll finish by each sharing a little something in What's Your Freak Out? Now let's get to it. Francesca, we are so excited to have you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Um, I love talking about um, just creeps and uh, yeah. taking just canceling uh, former heroes is my thing. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's a good time for that, isn't mm-hmm. it? It really is. If you aren't familiar with Francesca, um, which you will be after this, she's a stand-up comic and host of the Bituation Room podcast, which you should all subscribe to right now. Yes. Because it's very good. Anita was on. It was an excellent episode. I was. I'm never going to be invited back on, though, because I was like, well, I don't really care about anything. We got to (laughs) overthrow the system. It was my answer to literally everything. (laughs) You got to save that for our podcast, Anita. You can't bring that energy to other folks' podcasts. Yeah, you just have to pretend you care for an hour, Anita. Like, get, you know, get wonky about it. I guess I could have, like... I guess I could pay attention to things. I couldn't tell you who's running for president. Like, I don't give a fuck. No one can tell you. Yeah. You know, here's the thing is I don't want to feel guilty for not following news every second of every fucking day anymore. Like, no, I'll wait when we have candidates, then I'll be around for that. I guess maybe, maybe not. I don't know. It doesn't matter. This is a pop culture podcast has nothing to do with politics ever. Obviously. Uh, I think that I think you're doing what you need to do for your mental health. And I think you're right on. And, uh, this podcast is part of getting people through 2020 without the incessantness of politics. And I appreciate that. That is going to be our new (laughs) (laughs) pre-roll advertisement. (laughs) I love it. All right, we are going to throw to Carolyn for the entertainment news this week. Hey, everyone. Let's take a look at this week's entertainment news. Our top story this week, gamers continue to be awful. In other news, Netflix is moving forward with their plans to... Oh, okay, okay, okay. I guess I should explain a little bit of what I mean when I say that, you know, gamers continue to be awful. Um, so this past week, gamers, or, or rather, of course, a certain subset of gamers, you all know who I mean, flipped out over two different issues. First of all, it was announced that Borderlands 3 is going to be an Epic Store exclusive. To be honest, I, I, I try to read and understand the arguments about why this is so upsetting to so many gamers. You know, gamers who, by the way, so often use capitalism as a defense when it suits their needs. You know, I'll say things like, oh, you don't like sexism in games? Too bad. That's just the market giving players what they want. But, you know, these same people apparently want Valve to have like a virtual monopoly on online game sales. And they're outraged at the thought of, I guess having to keep an Epic store launcher running on their computer or something. I, I really don't get it. Um, it, it, you know, if somebody out there can explain to me what these people are actually upset about, I, 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 I'd love to hear it. Um, the other issue that had, again, a certain subset of gamers fuming this week was a conversation, an online you know, conversation, largely sparked by From Software's latest Tough as Nails game, uh, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, uh, a conversation about difficulty and accessibility in games. From Software is, of course, the makers of Demon Souls, the Dark Souls games, and Bloodborne, uh, games I myself like quite a bit. I mean, these are some of my favorite games of the past decade, some of them. Um, but, you know, many gamers maybe have a relationship with the difficulty of those games that's 
mm, perhaps not quite healthy. Uh, they maybe view it as like a test or a measurement of one's one's self worth. You know, uh, not you know as like a, a as like a human being, one's ability to like face and overcome challenges and just you know prove that you're like better than every everyone else. Um, you know, so meanwhile, organizations like Able Gamers advocate for accessibility options that would allow more players, uh, players who you know, aren't able for, for one reason or another to handle the existing control schemes or, or challenge levels of, um, or, or, you know, or other aspects of, of Sekiro or, or other games options that would let those players experience those games, or at least experience some of what those games have to offer. One Twitter response has already been, uh, memefied quite a bit by, those uh, mocking this uh, this attitude from from certain gamers. A PC gamer tweeted uh, a, a, an article that uh, with with their tweet saying, "I beat Sekiro's final boss with cheats and I feel fine." And one uh, one player's response to this on Twitter was, "You cheated not only the game but yourself." You didn't grow. You didn't improve. You took a shortcut and gained nothing. You experienced a hollow victory. Nothing was risked and nothing was gained. It's sad that you don't know the difference. Pretty hilarious, right? Uh, attitude. Uh, another response in, in that same Twitter thread was uh, this one. Kind of a harsh take, but in this scenario, you have to be harsh. Gaming is all about growth and evolution. You gain nothing by taking shortcuts. That's why I fucking hate speedrunners. Do it right or don't do it at all. You don't get rewarded for solving a tenth of the equation. Speedrunners, by the way, uh, speedrunning is, is, a, is a hobby that um, I, I love to watch. I don't speedrun myself, but I'm a big fan of speedrunning. And speedrunning is where you play a game and try to complete it um, in a, a, as short a time as possible. And it is often exceptionally difficult to to speed run a game at a high level because you have to pull off amazing tricks you know glitches to perform things the developers of the game never intended it takes extraordinary skill to speed run uh, uh most games so this notion of speed running as something that's easy is is laughable to anyone who really knows anything about speed running now, of course, I'm not saying that these issues are are simple. I understand how at times it, it may actually require some considerable thought and and work to determine how best to preserve the experience of a game, the intended experience of a game for all players, while also you know implementing accessibility options. I, I understand that this isn't a simple uh, cut and dry issue, but come on, people, some of these attitudes. Uh, are are so elitist and arrogant and obnoxious. Um, it's really embarrassing. All right. Now, in other news, uh, Netflix is moving forward with their live action adaptation of the cult classic anime series Cowboy Bebop. And many, many people were thrilled to hear that John Cho has been cast as protagonist Spike Spiegel. Um, it, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with Cowboy Bebop and what who Spike Spiegel is, here's Netflix's description of the character. Uh, they, they say that Spike Spiegel is an impossibly cool cowboy, uh, cowboy in quotes, in parentheses, bounty hunter, um, with a deadly smile, a wry wit, and style to spare. He travels the solar system with his ex-cop partner, Jet, pursuing the future's most dangerous bounties with a combination of charm, charisma, and deadly Jeet Kune Do. Now, I myself regret to say that I've only seen like two episodes of the original, uh, you know, animated Cowboy Bebop. Uh, uh, I definitely enjoyed them a lot. They are wonderfully stylish um, and, and quite captivating. So I'll have to rectify that and, and see the rest of the series uh, sometime before the live action show is released. And in other casting news, uh, comedian Kumail Nanjiani, who can currently be seen in the new Twilight Zone episode, The Comedian, which is actually free to watch on YouTube, is apparently up for a role alongside Angelina Jolie in the upcoming MCU movie, The Eternals, which is um, particularly exciting to me, that, that film, because it is set to be directed by Chloe Zhao, a Chinese filmmaker who directed one of my favorite films of last year, The Rider. 
All right, that's going to do it for this week's entertainment news. Hey, listeners, we love that you're tuning into our show where we deliver intersectional feminist analysis of pop culture every single week. You can help us keep bringing this sharp, honest, and sometimes funny analysis to you by joining our podcast community on Patreon. In exchange for your dollars, we've got some perks like early access, weekly bonus episodes, AMAs, and an amazing community that hangs out on our private Discord server. So please consider joining us at patreon.com slash femfreak. So let's get to it. Um, Today's discussion, um, we just want to give a little bit of a warning because it is a really intense documentary that we're talking about with very intense issues around abuse and sexual assault. And some folks might find it really difficult to listen to. So we want to make sure that we let people know about resources that can help survivors or that are sorry available to survivors of sexual assault. So please, you can reach out to RAIN, the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network. They're the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization, and they operate a national sexual assault hotline. So you can give them a call at 800-656-HOPE or they're online, they're at online.rain, R-A-I-N-N dot org. Um, and they work in partnership with um, more than a thousand local sexual assault service providers around the country. So if you feel like you need someone to talk to, please reach out. If this episode is too difficult for you, please don't listen to it. <laughs> it's not necessary. We will have lots of other episodes full of bullshit that you can listen to. All right. So... Let's do this. Leaving Neverland is a two-part documentary on HBO that came out this year detailing the years-long child sexual abuse perpetrated by Michael Jackson on two young boys. The two survivors who tell their stories in the film are James Safechuck and Wade Robson, and they recount the harrowing experiences of being groomed and seduced by the King of Pop. It is agonizing to watch this film and it'll probably be pretty difficult to talk about it, to be honest. But here, we're doing it. We're doing it. So, yeah, Francesca, been, oh, God, you chose sorry. this topic. <laughs> oh, please. Th- th- thanks, Ebony. Please take the fall. <laughs> I, I, I have been dreading this episode. <laughs> I've been so excited to have you on, but dreading this episode for weeks. Um, and I put off watching the documentary until the last minute. And that could not have been a bigger mistake because it meant I had to watch all of it yesterday. I do this to myself. I did it with the Surviving R. Kelly documentary. Well, yeah, Ebony and I watched, which was longer. We watched all of the R. Kelly documentary in one day, and it was excruciating. It was excruciating. And then I watched uh, the Lorena doc all Uh at once. It's, It's too much. It's too much. You know, um, you're torn between wanting to honor the incredible courage um, and fortitude of these survivors who are putting themselves and their stories um, out in front of the public for a vital reason. You know, so you're torn between wanting to honor that and wanting to to witness as is necessary um, uh, what they're saying and recounting. And between wanting to crawl into a hole and just let the earth be scorched, you know, because people are terrible and none of us deserve life. It was horrific. And I honestly, I don't, I feel completely insufficient to talk about what I just watched. Completely insufficient. Because what can you say in the face of this, this horrible thing? What can you say? Yeah, probably not the best lead in. Like, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. I just, I don't, I don't, I don't even know. I, I, like yeah. I said, I've been dreading this because I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to say. I think that there's a really interesting momentum happening right now with um, the fact that we sort of back to back had the R. Kelly documentary come out, the Lorena Bobbitt documentary come out, and this one, which are all in the same time. And it's not like... There's always these interesting moments when these things are all happening around the same time because they were obviously in production for a while. And I feel like we're in a moment of listening to and believing survivors in a way that we never have before. And not to say that it's not to say that like we have achieved the goals of feminism or that all survivors are believed as we can go into with the f- fucking horrible defenses of celebrities that have come out around this documentary. But I think that 
you know, we need to be good to ourselves in like how much of this trauma we take on in secondary ways, but also like how fucking powerful is it for the, like for this one, for these two kids, I'm sorry, these two grown men to talk about this thing that they've hidden for so long. Um, did Francesca, did you watch the R Kelly documentary and the Lorena one? I did not watch the Lorena Bobbitt documentary and I would really like to, I need to, um, cause, uh, you know, like, I just want to wear an enamel pin of her and anything that can get me there, <laughs> I want. <laughs> um, but no, I did watch the Surviving R. Kelly doc, and I totally agree um, that we're in a different moment now, especially after Me Too, uh, that we can finally hear from, I think, two communities who've been suffering, um, who've always suffered uh, sexual violence um, and who don't always get a chance to speak out about it and whose voices aren't always listened to. And those are black women and um, men and specifically young kids. So those three communities who, um, b- because of systemic racism and sexism and patriarchy, I think, are often silenced on this issue. Um, there's, you know, for me watching both documentaries uh, – Immediately, my first thought is this is required viewing. Like I, and yes, if you uh, are a survivor and if you are, you know, triggered in a real way by some of these stories, obviously you can, you know, give yourself a break. But for me, especially with with both of these, it's like just because it's hard to watch doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to do so. Uh, and I felt like it was critical viewing. Um, I like, you know, grew up child of the 80s. Um, My brother and I were super into Michael Jackson. Um, I like, you know, I I loved the Moonwalker, watched that on repeat, Speed Demon, love that stuff, you know, Black or White, Macaulay Culkin, hell yeah. Shut up, dad, I'm playing my music. You know, like I'm I'm all about, I was was a big MJ head and I... um, you know, uh, I'm like now I was born in 83. So I hit the cusp. And so like the idea that he loved kids, like I was still young when it was like, oh yeah, Michael Jackson just loves children. Cause like McDonald's loves children. Right. <laughs> you know, like, like that was, it was all, it was all wrapped up in like, this is just one big early, you know, mid eighties happy meal. And it makes, you know, heal the world, make it a better place. Um, you know, yay, like post-racist, you know, we love all children, you know, save Africa. I don't know. You know, that was like the the MO back then. So it wasn't weird to me that he was hanging out with young kids um, because I was a young kid. And it was like, oh, yeah, this is our Ronald McDonald of pop music. Yeah. I can't like. So. The R. Kelly documentary sat with me in horrifying ways. There's something about the way that both Wade and James described the abuse. It was very clinical. Oh, God. Um, it, it stuck out to me at how clinical their language was. And I am lit- like going about my day and get these visions of what happened. Yeah. Like, I don't – in a way that I didn't necessarily with the other document – not to compare them. Um, I just found my reaction – To this, like, I woke up this morning and I started thinking about it and, like, picturing it. And it was so vivid and it's so horrifying. And one of the things that, you know, Ebony, you and I talked a bunch about how, like, the whole fucking industry knew that R. Kelly was doing this stuff. Um, The whole fucking industry and world knew that Michael Jackson was doing this, too. And we didn't want to believe it for all of – for similar reasons, right? And there's something about, like, you know – I just kept thinking the whole time I was watching this, I was like, so, you know, we're demanding to take R. Kelly off the radio. Why aren't we demanding to take Michael Jackson off the radio? Like, that will never happen. Like, he is such a beloved figure and there will be such a a clamoring to hold on to the value that he contributed um, musically Mm -hmm. in a way that I don't think R. Kelly holds. I, I actually think there's something like crucially different about the way in which people were complicit around R. Kelly and the way people um, were complicit and continue to be complicit around um, the legacy of Michael Jackson. And I think part of what made 
R. Kelly um, able to, you know, abuse for for so long is that there is a pre-existing narrative about fast girls, Mm -hmm. right? And about um, young girls, particularly young Black girls, being both more mature um, physically, but also more mature sexually, and all at the same time, simultaneously, being less worthy of of protection, uh, right? And so it was very easy to not see them Mm-hmm. As, as victims. Um, with Michael Jackson, I think conversely what's going on is that it is so impossible for us to truly reckon with the notion of young boys with men being sexual violence victims. Um, so we, we need to unpack that. But also it's so horrifying. The notion of child sexual abuse is so horrifying yeah. That we we don't want to have to deal with it. Because if we say, you know what, Michael Jackson or anyone has has committed this horrible act, it demands that we have a response. It's not something that you can, it's not wire fraud where you can be like, eh, you know what, I, I just don't care. I'm choosing not to have an opinion about this. You have to have an opinion. You have to have a reaction to child sexual abuse. And I think People don't want to think about it. They absolutely do not want to think about it. And so it's easier to say this could not have happened. And so you have people coming up with all these rationalizations for Michael Jackson's behavior, you know, from he's just a kid himself, you know, he sees himself as a Peter Pan figure, you know, oh, we have the as many times as someone said like he just seems so childish it seemed like a child's bedroom his house seemed like a wonderland for children sorry to interrupt you ebony but like the fact that these parents were like but he just seemed like a kid to me yeah like not even forget the not don't forget the abuse but even that behavior is so already complicit i mean and that's i think that this doc was so here was my trajectory watching this and i want to speak to what both of you are saying about what the difference is between r kelly and 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 uh, michael jackson but start off watching the doc and i'm like okay okay let's see what they have to say just listen to the you know you know these these two accounts uh and because because i think leading up to this i'm like man we know michael jackson's a weirdo we don't know necessarily what happened. He died in, you know, a, a pretty tragic way. And, and um, and you know, his music is bigger than he will ever be. Uh, he didn't have a childhood. You know, you tell yourself those things. And also, I think what he represented, not just to the black community, but to all people. Like, he was bigger than... But, but anyway, so there's a part of me trying to, like, I, I want... I don't want to, like tear this person down. So, you know, the documentary starts off and it's like, okay, Wade Robeson, where did he, where was he born and what was he going through? And like, in my head, I was like, oh yeah, you know what Michael Jackson was doing? He was studying his lines and making sure that the Jackson 5 didn't go under, you know, like he was, he was Mm -hmm. putting, he was a overworked child who, you know, and I'm like, you know, he was giving us hits. That's what he was doing. So like my initial reaction is that. Because again, child of the 80s, super supportive. Then as we go through, And the people, you know, and they're mostly online who are saying that somehow these survivors are making this up. You look and watch at at the accounts and how detailed, like Anita was saying, and how, especially for James Safechuck, this feels like the second time, maybe even the first time he's saying these things out loud and you see you see it in his head as he's like, and you know, articulating it, and you're like, "Oh man, this is like, no one can make this up. This is the detail of this, and like the reckoning." And I think what's different for me about about um, about um, about Michael Jackson uh, is that, and the fact that this documentary could only have been made after his death is that these two men were huge fans, and not just fans, but essentially boyfriends they were essentially groomed boyfriends of michael jackson and they themselves especially james i think has this really um honest and 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 i wouldn't i don't want to say nuanced but honest way of like it felt like we were boyfriend boyfriend 
that we were doing something that was wrong, but that I was being let in on that. And I felt special. And I think a lot of child sexual assault victims feel the exact same way. And that's why the reporting on child sexual assault victims is really low because it's usually someone who is older than you. It's someone who you respect. It might even be someone, imagine if it's not just someone who's older than you, someone you respect, it's Michael Jackson. And both of them say, I never wanted to hurt him. I never wanted, I don't want him to be in prison. I could never imagine him in prison. In fact, both of these men testified on his behalf that he did not touch them. That has a lot to do with the patterns of abuse and what abusers do, right? Like, it's very textbook. Like, right. as they were describing what happened to them, I was like, this is literally exactly what abusers do, right? They, like, they build these environments where it's just you and them against the world. Right. They remove you from other people and your family in, like, very real ways. And, like, they get into your head. And, like, I thought the f- the documentary did... I mean, both of these men articulated so well and the documentary was edited so well to really drive home the point of like he manipulated the fuck out of them and a a big part of abuse whether it's emotional or physical is the the psychological manipulation of like you're going to be in trouble right like what we're doing nobody else understands and that is deep and when you're talking about fucking michael jackson right right like this isn't and not that it's any different necessarily with like you know a partner that is someone that works at a bank or whatever. But like, like you were saying, these are not only were they huge fans, but also like, this is one of the most famous people, like people in the world. And they're giving you that attention. Right. Like that's intoxicating. And he knew it. Like, and they're like, you know, all this shit about like, oh, he's like childlike himself. And, you know, I, I, first I was thinking about how, like when you are abused, um, oftentimes you don't emotionally grow. And so when you talk to abuse victims, you kind of like can think about them as the age in which they were abused, right? Mm-hmm. And so I was like, oh, that might be what's happening here. But he was so um, aware of every step of this. He was very conscious in the manipulation um, and how he was doing it and how he would get what he wanted. So from the very beginning, this this documentary does a wonderful job showcasing how child um, sex abuse victims can have very complicated feelings towards their abusers. Yes. So we have Wade Robson say, this was my idol and he was kind and he was funny and he listened to me and, you know, he was giving and he was soft dot, dot, dot. And he sexually abused me for seven years. And so the ways in which you can have, you know, love and affection for someone that is abusing you, this is something that's weaponized, you know, very deliberately by abusers against their victims, because you have victims say, um, survivors say, well, maybe I'm partially to blame. It couldn't have been that bad because I still love this person, right? you know, and I wouldn't love this person if they had really hurt me. So was it really abuse? Was I really raped? You know, what culpability do I have? And um, I think that's the other thing. And abusers prey on that. Right. And the other thing that I think we need to remember when it comes to child sexual abuse is that it often happens within families, right? So other people mm-hmm. that you really love and you're supposed to love. Um, and when you love someone just the way that these two men loved Michael Jackson, and again, this wouldn't have happened were he still alive because they didn't want to see him in prison. And I think the way yeah. that our criminal justice system works, especially around child sexual assault, is that you really see that victims are falling between the cracks here because we don't have nuanced and smart and community-based ways of holding people accountable for their abuse. Mm -hmm. And so it's either, okay, I'm going to call out my abuser and maybe send my dad or uncle or whomever, my cousin to jail. Like, I don't want that. Or, and, or ruin my family. I don't want that either. How are we – and I think, you know, there's an organization called Generation 5 which works with um, victims of child sexual abuse. And they – the reason they're called Generation 5 is because 
they say um, ending child sexual assault in five generations because if you were abused, you are potentially more likely to abuse and it and it continues not to, you know, d- demonize victims, of course. But but just saying that, like, they have very much a community based approach and and we haven't just like we haven't developed the language around, let's say, um, stories of sexual assault that were not so much assault as they were really creepy interactions um, that were they were consensual, but it was like bad, you know, bad. Like the I'm thinking of Aziz Ansari's, you know, uh, you know, the account against him, um, which was just like really sounded like a a crappy interaction. Like just I mean, that's not the best example, but you know what I'm saying? That the way that like we don't know how to actually take down abusers in a way that like also heals and also um, doesn't destroy a whole community or a family. Like we don't. Yeah. So yeah. like restorative justice or transformative justice instead of just like you're a criminal and should be locked away. But how do we actually heal the community? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really also want to talk about the families and the um, the way that the, the ecosystem of fame um, really betrayed mm. these these two young boys such that kids can be very smart, you know? Um, so it would it was impossible for these two boys not to recognize that, you know, in addition to this access I have to this megastar, now my families have access to a realm of fame and privilege that they would not have had access to before. My family's getting to travel to America. We're flying first class. We're staying in the best hotels. You know, we're, we're going to this very exclusive place that not everyone has access to. If I tell people what's been going on, if I truly start to think through what's been going on, not only am I going to lose this access, but my parents and my siblings will lose that access as well. And, you know, um, they, the, the documentary, when we talk to uh, Joy, I think it's Joy, Wade Robson's mother, who's like, you know, I wanted to, you know, start over again in America. You know, my marriage wasn't that great. And, you know, James Safechuck's mom's like, yeah, you know, my husband and I were, um, were not sleeping in the same room. And so it was sometimes, you know, it was an escape to be able to get to Neverland. Kids pick up on that, you yeah. know? Yeah. I do want to talk about the mothers real quick. Um, I, so it's very easy for us to be like, what the fuck were they thinking? And they definitely hold a lot of accountability here in some ways. Um, not in some ways. They hold accountability here. And I think um, I think that it's I, – I will also say I think it's incredibly brave for these men to speak as candidly as they did. Um, and I think it's actually really brave for the mothers to be – as candid as they were as well in this, like that whole, like the fact that as a documentarian, we're able to get these testimonies and that frankness and candidness and like the grief and pain that you see in everybody. Um, I, so yeah, the thing is that I think that it's not unreasonable for us to lay blame on parents, um, especially the mothers, the families in this situation, because they got caught up in all of this shit too. Like you were just talking about Ebony. Um, I think that we live in such a world that I and I hope that these kinds of films are working to end this where it is we are not trained to see the signals. We're not trained to understand that this is a thing that happens and it can happen to us and to our children. And I remember hearing stories of my friends who have survived abuse as children and their parents just thought that they were depressed kids. Mm -hmm. Right. They were just like, oh, that's they're just quiet. They're just, you know, whatever. Like they just, I think that parents make a lot of justifications for the behavior of their children and don't know the symptoms. Um, And so like part of me really actually does feel for them in terms of like how deep their grief is and their shame that they're going to live with forever that they got caught up in this bullshit. But also I don't feel bad. Like I want them to live with that shame because like – yeah, like the, you, your children are fucking broken forever. Yeah, no, I mean, what did? Yeah, what are you doing? What do you? I don't care who it is, right? You don't let them sleep in the same bed. It's fucking weird, and that's on you. I can see it all happening. Like I can a hundred percent see why it all happened, but it's fucking bad. Really, shit. come on, Anita. I think you're smarter. Like, there's just something I in know. Me but just I, like, the reason I can see it happening is because I think people. I think that. I mean. 
people are so caught up in celebrity. That's what it is. They're so caught up in fame in ways that I don't think, like, this is going to sound so obnoxious. I don't think you and I get it in the same way because of our lives and who we are and the people that we're around. But, like, the level of starstruckness, I think, can make people do really fucking stupid shit. Oh, yeah. I've embarrassed myself in front of, like, a couple of... (laughs) A couple of heroes. But that's what I mean. Like, at some point, I think that one, the combination of, of celebrity, the combination of like, he seems like such a calm, like such a sweet, generous He's dude. a kid himself. Yeah, he's a kid himself. The fact that he is deeply manipulative and manipulated everybody in these situations. Like, I, I am not justifying any of this. And one, he is squarely to blame for everything. But I get like hearing their stories and the situations, I understand how it could have happened. I just also think that they're fucked up. Like, yeah, I think I think you the, could let that I happen is fucked up. This the 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 big difference to me between the two documentaries is that R. Kelly, the, the surviving R. Kelly documentary, was so good in that it not only gave you oh I don't know dozen or um, maybe yeah fifteen or so survivors accounts. Um, but that there were analysts and psychologists and writers and people who study this issue that really allowed as a viewer you to kind of um, digest this and walk away with some lessons. This did not do that, right? Leaving, I right. kept waiting for a psychologist to come on board same, and talk same, about right. abuse. It was on the viewer to really have a fine-tuned sort of emotional intelligence to really watch the – transformation of each of the people who went on camera was only like four right or five and the mothers were one of those i kept on watching like when do they admit that they really were in the wrong when do they and at the end you know i think you you get there but in but in for a very long time you're sort of waiting for that and i i would have loved to hear the documentarian and the interviewer push back a little bit and i think that's the one thing that they deserved it. They needed to hear a little bit. And maybe they just cut that question out. But like, um, why would you think it was ever okay to have a grown man in bed with your seven-year-old? You know? Right. In what world like is that okay? I the documentary was made linearly. Like, it was literally just tell us your story. Sure. And maybe As that's you know, like, how they got I, them to agree to go on camera. Yeah, I, I was waiting for... What the the R. Kelly documentary um, did, what Dream Hampton offered was kind of a a universe of perspectives, you know, and there was so much context, you know, so people from Mm -hmm. R. Kelly's camp, um, people from the survivors camp, you know, um, you know, psychologists, as you suggest, you know, and there's, there's, um, you know, news reports and there's just, there's, there's so much, you know, and for the most part, it's an incredibly well packaged. So we do learn about both this specific person and his bad acts, but also the culture in which this sort of thing happens. Um, this particular documentary is so specific. And there, there were many times when I, I wanted the, the camera and the focus to kind of pull back a little bit. And talk a little bit more about what does it mean? Because there is a lot that the documentary doesn't deal with, except kind of, you know, obliquely, um, but about how we frame um, child sexual abuse or sexual assault in general when race, wealth, and gender, Mm -hmm. you know, all come into play. It absolutely matters. And fame. um, That Mike... Yeah, you know, that that Michael Jackson's victims were young white boys. Like, it absolutely matters to our understanding. And they weren't all what's... white boys, which I, in which this I documentary. thought at first, but yeah. yeah. You know, it but, but in this, exactly, that are, that are presented here. And that's part of, unfortunately, one of the things, um, uh, the perspectives that people are using to, to defend Michael Jackson is like, you know, oh, this is a very racist takedown, you know, right. um, it's the, you know, these white people coming after this black entertainer, et cetera, you know, but I, I wanted more at the same time that I was like, I cannot watch more. I had to go from watching this on my TV <laughs> to watching it on a laptop to watching it on my phone. I needed to make it smaller. Like I needed to physically make it smaller because I couldn't be surrounded by this. At one point when I was watching it on my laptop, I was walking from rooms, like I couldn't sit still and and listen to what these, you know, men were saying. I'm walking around with my laptop watching it. um, And, you know, I'm, 
hard of hearing. So the sound was up pretty loud. And it was at a moment when I think James Savechuck is, um, you know, recounting in like horrific detail some of uh, the, the sexual abuse, right? And it occurred to me, oh my God, if my neighbors hear this, this two minute sequence or whatever, they're going to call the fucking cops on me because they're going to be like, what is she listening to? Yeah, no, I can't, I can't do, I can't do sex normal after this documentary. It's, it's, it's done. We have to cancel sex, I think. And (laughs) yeah, man, we have to cancel Um, Peter Pan for sure. For (sighs) reals. Jesus. Uh, The fucking cutout of Peter Pan. Are you kidding me? Oh my God. (sighs) The description of that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wait. (laughs) Yeah, um, we didn't get a chance to talk about um, the defenses by Barbara Streisand and Diana Ross. So let's move that into the bonus, because I think that there's um, an important conversation to be had about like the tight grip that we have on like folks defending in the face of overwhelming evidence, um, the status quo. All right. God, I don't even want us to do freakouts. I just want this to be over. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, this, it was an entire me. I can't out. do this anymore. Do you have any last thoughts you want to share? Um, my last thoughts are that I don't think that it matters whether we cancel Michael Jackson or not. I think, again, he is he's larger than life. He's larger than music. It's like canceling air, rain, water. Like it's they, These are hits, and it, it means nothing. I think we should actually tackle child sexual abuse in a real way and make it safer for survivors to speak out. That's the work. Canceling him means nothing at this point. That is a great way to end this segment. (laughs) Thank you. Let's move on to... What's your freak out? Ebony, you got something? (laughs) Yeah, so after, (laughs) after just, you know, losing my remaining faith in humanity after watching this, I wanted to curl up into something that just made me feel okay again. And so I read a couple of Ramona Quimby books. Yes. Um, what? <laughs> wonderful Ramona Quimby books. Those are by, my favorite. Yeah, Beverly Cleary. Like, Fuck. I don't know what to say other than those books were so, so foundational to me as a kid. Yeah. Um, and as I grew older, you know, yeah, I grew up with Ramona, but also I felt like Ramona at times, but I also really felt like Beezus because I have a younger brother who was a huge pest. Um, just the honest, loving, hilarious, infuriating way that Beverly Cleary captures childhood, um, but makes it so safe uh, was very important for me. It allowed me to go to sleep. (laughs) Yeah. It allowed me to, to go to sleep last night. So thank God for, uh, Miss Beverly Cleary, who is, I believe like 103 years old, still alive. Is she really? She really is. Man, I grew up on those books too. I still have my original copy of Ramona, the past that I had when I was a kid. Oh, so, so good. And I was looking up, um, images cause I, like I grew up, God, I can't remember the name of the illustrator for the editions that came out in the 80s. But the original illustrations by Lewis Darling are just amazing. So I encourage people to check those out because those were just, they had such life. Yeah, that and the boxcar children where you're like, yeah, it's cool to, you know, live in a trailer. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Well, I would love boxcars. Nothing wrong with that. (laughs) So what if we have to skip town and we don't have parents? Let's let's ride the rails. Let's do this. Francesca, what are you freaking out about this week? I'm freaking out about uh, yoga that is bastardizes culture. Um, mm. There's a very fine difference between um, cultural appropriation yoga, which which is some you know that's sort of like where you know the the teacher is named Iris and she studied yoga in India for like a week and she like you know. F- farts sandalwood and sweats lavender and you know that she's like 93 pounds there's that and that is then, a great tender bio yeah <laughs> i i i don't i fart sandalwood is that cool um <laughs> and uh and then there's cultural bastardization which is like the the new yoga which is stri- it basically replaces like hindu gods with lululemon leggings and um, oh boy it is, you know, there, there's all this appropriation and like, like culture smashing, usually done by white people of like, you know, this yoga studio, our slogan is a tribe called sweat, RIP five dog. Oh, oh my God. Have you, oh, 
And so, there are a bunch of those in LA that I've been fucking losing it about. The like, the, uh, what was the one that's like Namaste? Namaste um, LA. Yeah, that's the same. It's the oh, same it one. Says, yeah. Oh, it, and it's just mm-hmm. very, it's like, you know, you go into places and they're like every, it's like a people of color hunting lodge because like every ethnicity has been stripped of its essence and just like yeah. smashed on the wall. There was like a shirt. I, I remember I saw this one studio that's like, I want a hot bod, but I also want tacos. You're like, fucking kill yourself. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm freaking out about the fact that there's like only like, there's there's very few safe yoga spaces that I either don't go too much in the realm of cultural appropriation or too much in this realm of like we're just gonna pimp this thing out for everything that it's not you know and like listen to trap music in the studio I'm like I, I can't I can't relax to yo that. Renee Bracy Sherman, a friend of Feminist Frequency, amazing, amazing activist, tweeted this morning that she was just in a yoga class and she was like, I was the only person of color in the room yeah. and the entire soundtrack was trap music. <laughs> and I was like, I would have set that studio on fire. There I would have locked so the doors many. and set it on fire. Yeah, I would 9-11 that yoga studio. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> JK, nonviolently, obviously. Um but, sure. But people yeah. need to, you know, y- y- yeah. It's unfortunately, I did look into who runs the yoga studio I'm talking about, and it was started by what I th- I believe to be a a hapa, a half Asian woman, uh, as am I. And I feel like I don't know. Sometimes we let the whiteness get the better of us. So sometimes, though, I feel like people of color are running a scam, and I'm like, you know what? If you can get white people to fall for this, and <laughs> they will straight up fall for a lot, go ahead and make those coins. Take that right, money, right. you know? <laughs> but other times I'm like, oh, boo-boo, what are you doing? Like, yeah, there are larger yeah, yeah. implications. <laughs> All right. I want to talk about media and class. And so I caught up on – when I'm on planes, I'll often watch things that I don't particularly want to watch but I want to be able to know about so I watched Green Book on a flight mm. recently mistake yeah well you know like it's such a cult it's it's going that is going to be a part of our cultural conversation about race for a long time and I felt like I needed to know about it um I was struck by the class dynamics of this film in a way that I was not anticipating because so much of the conversation was around the white savior and the race aspect of it. Um, I didn't see, I know that you and Carolyn talked about it on the episode of our show, but I was so struck by it. And I'm also partly feel like we don't talk about class very often when we talk about media. It's it's not, you know, just as we're trying to make disability much more present and prominent as a, a form of oppression and how <laughs> important that representation is and what that looks like, I feel like class often gets erased too. And this film was so fucked up with class. And I think mm-hmm. it was sort of supposed to be glossed over because the stereotypes of who is like, upper class versus who is like working class is swapped in terms of race. Um, but the, it just was fucked up, man. Like yeah. the, 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 the attempt to make, I don't fucking remember who anyone's names are in that movie. Don Shirley. But like, Va- yes. Val Longa. He, yes. Val Longa. Like the, the stuff about his name, the stuff about like the way he talks and eats and all of the shit, like just the, the sheer judgment of all of that. But but like, uh, anyways, it really it really bothered me. And I think part of why we don't talk about class very much when it comes to media stuff is because too often we don't address class in media. Like everyone on TV is rich and every apartment in New York is fucking massive. And like, you know, we but don't what specifically talk about where you, the money comes from. What 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 did you feel like this got wrong in terms of class? I'm I'm totally like. Uh, I think that when you put green box in a in a, in a or green book in a box. Uh, and you're like, you realize it was written by the son of Villa Longa and it was like, and the Farley brothers. And it's a feel good, like r- white people narrative, uh, you know, and, and, you know, like it is, it did happen, but you, you put it in that Academy Award safe for, you know, a best picture box. And then it all kind of is okay. 
is okay. Not okay, but like that's what I do with it. But I am interested in in terms of what you mean about like class. That what about this film? Yeah, like the the idea is that they had to find a middle ground, right? That it wasn't like either of them were okay where they're at in terms of their class presentations. It's that like you know the the idea is that um, Don Shirley was proper and he was like attempting to be like quote unquote white man proper, mm-hmm. um, and and that that's where he felt like he fit and. Um, What's his face? Phil, the 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 Tony What's Lip. It? Tony, yes, thank you. Tony Lip was like needed to be corrected, and the way he lived his life was not appropriate. But that you know, just as you get, uh, just as he stops being a little bit racist, they can he can stop being a little bit classist, and everything is fucking a okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the 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 film finds Don Shirley to be a ridiculous character. You know, um, as if his his manner of speech, the way he dresses, the way he decorates his space, you know, he is presented as a farcical character who needs to be made more authentic. And the issue is not, at least in terms of you know, in the universe of the film, the issue is not that he is rich. The issue is that he is a rich black man. You know, that he is a privileged black man, as if there's something so ridiculous about a black man who, you know, insists on being called doctor, insists on, you know, speaking what's termed standard English, who, you know, has a throne. Like the way the film encourages us to think about Don Shirley as a character who's hiding something, who is not embracing his real blackness through the medium of, you know, like his his wealth, his comparative wealth, you know, I think is, is pretty clear, you know? And I think the film like is pretty self-congratulatory about the fact that, you know, Tony Lip comes from this like, you know, working class, like it's, it matters that he's Italian, you know? I think um, the other sort of like spicy white ethnicities in America could also have stood in. So maybe like the Irish or something or Greek or whatever. But I don't think we would have gotten the same kind of, um, you know, class discussion or class journey in this film if he were, say, Swedish, working class Swedish or something. Sure. I mean, they're like uh, they're the same, you know, when you when you tic tac toe with race and class gets all. (laughs) <laughs> you know, you line them up or whatever. And you just they cancel each other out, and they're the same guy. Mm-hmm. They're the same guy. Um, I yeah. I have to listen to your take, Ebony. I have I don't have that strong of feelings about the movie, but I'm also not as I, I wasn't as bothered by it. I'm like, yeah, put in the box, Green Book in the box. My mom liked it. You know, fine. You should watch listen to our episode about <laughs> about that movie. You know, it, well, it was a lot of Carol and I just being like. <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? Which is always my favorite episodes. All right, y'all. That is our show. You can catch us back here every single Wednesday. Stay tuned for the freaking after party, which is only available to backers of this podcast, which you can be by heading over to patreon.com slash femfreak. If you're enjoying the show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And I don't have any witty remark. Just tell your friends because this is not an episode that I can do that with. Check out all our work and our other podcasts at FeministFrequency.com. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at FemFreak to stay up to date on all of the news. Francesca, thank you so much for being an amazing guest. Where can yes. folks find find you or find out more about you? Oh, yeah. Just follow me on the social meds at Franny Fio, F-R-A-N-I-F-I-O. Franny Fio. Um, and that's it. Thank you for having awesome. me. Awesome. You can find me at Anita Sarkeesian. You can find uh, Carolyn, who is not on this episode, but is really the best of all of us at Carolyn Michelle. And Ebony, where are you this week? I am at Abona Quimby. Ooh. <laughs> I'm into it. Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music. Technical support by Sarah Norales. Production assistance by Taylor Simmons. Art by Jamie Varon. We'll see you next week. Bye. 